All right, so I'm parked outside the legendary Billy Goat right across from Tribune Tower. In my Mazda 3 is the Reverend Horton Heat. We've got some burgers. We're going to eat. We're going to talk about the Rev's career. But I should mention, if you switch to Boost Mobile, your taxes and fees are included on all plans. Plus, get two lines with three gigs of 4G LTE per line for just 50 bucks. It's all on the fast and reliable Sprint Nationwide Network. Boost makes it easy to switch. Switching makes it easy to save. Reverend Horton Heat, Jim Heath, are you ready? I'm ready. It's Car Con Carne. So we're recording this. Reverend Horton Heat is right here. We've got burgers from Billy Goat. We're recording this at the tail end of a massive stand here in Chicago. You love this town. This town oh, loves yeah. you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is a great, great city. It really is. And, you know, I mean, if you, if you look at the what's the number one city in the world, I mean, if, if Chicago's either got to be that or number two, you know. I mean, it's the best in the world. So, yeah, we love it, and the people are great here and friendly, and, um, you know, it's it's everything you'd never want in a big city. So we're <laughs> eating Billy Goat Burgers. You've never been here. There, there's so much history. I warned you before we ordered, just ask for a double. Because yeah. you asked for a burger, and right away she said, the double, it's thin patties, you should get that. They, they won't suffer single burger orders here at Billy Goat. It's on the menu, but they don't even... <laughs> and, who, you know, who are you to argue? Right. Well, when in Rome, Give me right? a double, that's uh, right. Give me a okay. double. Okay. Uh, and this all reminds me of Let Me Teach You How to Eat, a song <laughs> from the most recent Rev album. That video, by the way, you've got, like, hot pinup girls in, in the kitchen eating food. Isn't that why you got into rock and roll in the first place, to be able to make a video like that? Absolutely, yes. Uh huh. <laughs> that's it. Singing about food, hot pinup girls. That's right. Done that, and done. It's rock and roll, man. When I think about the Reverend Horton Heat, it, that video actually is a perfect springboard. I think about American culture. I feel like you're a student and a fan of American culture, but American culture going back several decades. I mean, whether it's musically, aesthetically, the clothes you wear on stage. I mean, there, there's a certain era and style that the Reverend Horton Heat represents. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, that's right. I'm very influenced by mid-century stuff. So the music, rockab- like rockabilly music mm-hmm. from the 50s, but 50s music in general, but then all this, all the other stuff, surf guitar music as well as the country music, but then the cars and the atomic furniture and mm-hmm. the... Mid-century modern houses and Frank Lloyd Wright and 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 all the kitschy type of appliances and and stuff that were in people's kitchens and you know were really cool back then. So I, I'm just really enamored with the whole era. And when I think about the songs you cover on stage, whether it's Chuck Berry or Motorhead or Johnny Cash, I, I realize that is your DNA. Yep. Well, you mentioned Motorhead, but that's English. But but, but no. I mean that that energy, that kind of rawness. But but the beat of that song is very similar to to a, an American bluegrass type of a thing. So, uh, oh yeah, you know I'm I I, I I can't remember who all you just named. But Chuck John, Berry, but, Johnny Cash. But Johnny Cash and oh yeah, we did a Chuck Berry song last night. We, uh, Johnny Cash uh, is we. We got to play a show and meet Johnny Cash one time, and uh, now, hang on, was what was that like? Uh, it was kind of scary. It was Wait. epic. It was, but he was real nice, and his uh, and June Carter was real nice, and uh, he talked to us for for a minute, and then June Carter came and grabbed him by the ear, and and dra- and started pulled him out while he was still talking to us. That's amazing. Like, Come on, we have to go. Come on, we have to go. And he just followed her out. <laughs> That's amazing. Now, do you remember, going back to, you pretty much knew you were going to have a career in rock and roll dating back to when you were a teenager. What was the first song you learned how to play on guitar? Well. When you picked up that first Gretsch, or whatever your first guitar was. It wasn't a Gretsch, it was an old (laughs) Stella. But the thing was, is that my cousins played, and I I had a cousin that came, uh, he was on leave from Vietnam, he was a, a Marine, and he was pretty wild, and he'd saved up his money, bought a Camaro, and it had an eight-track player, 
and he took me for a ride and he came to visit us and I must have been about 10 years old and I think he was driving 80 miles an hour down Staples Street in Corpus Christi it, it was crazy how fast he was driving but he was playing an eight track tape of uh, live at Folsom Prison with John with Johnny Cash mm -hmm. or I, I, it was it was one of those live ones I'm not mm -hmm. exactly sure on an eight track in his car and I heard Johnny Cash singing Folsom Prison Blues and I heard the reaction of the I was 10 years old, so I didn't really know about lyrics yet, but it, I really learned the power of lyrics when he would, you know, sing a line and about, you know, I you know shot a man in Reno just to watch him die, and the, the crowd, you know, those prisoners were like, yeah, you know, <laughs> like, it just all came to life, this whole lyrical thing, and so that was the first song I wanted to learn to play, and I tried to learn off the record. I thought I was learning how to play, like, Johnny Cash. Mm-hmm. And really, I was learning, trying to learn how to play guitar like Luther Perkins. Exactly. I didn't realize, <laughs> didn't realize that at the time. But, but anyway, I have a cousin that, that could play it, and I, he remembers me being, you know, ten or eleven years old, saying, "Do that again, do that again, do it again," because I was trying to learn how. To, he was trying to show me how to play it, you know. And, but that's that's the first one. And well, I, I love your lyrics and the power of the lyric. You also have a lot of fun. The, the songs you write. There, there is definitely a great sense of humor throughout. One of my favorite lyrics you've ever written, and you'll probably never hear anyone else say this, death metal guys. Rockabilly oh, yeah. guys, like mm -hmm. rockabilly chicks, death metal guys think they're all country hicks. Uh, but death metal guys still live with their mom on the internet learning how to embalm. <laughs> that's, that's it. And yeah. that, that's why rockabilly culture, why the culture that you represent is so <laughs> awesome. It's just, you know, when I listen to the Reverend Horton Heat, I want to drive fast. I want to get laid. I want to get drunk. That's what the Reverend Horton Heat does for me. Yeah, just don't do all those at right. the same time. Yeah, you have to be you have to be careful about how you how you schedule yeah. all that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's I... rock and roll, though, right? <laughs> yeah, that's and it's right. poor. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, good. <laughs> you know, as someone who's worked in radio forever, radio has never really known what to do with the Reverend Horton Heat. The irony is, your music is compatible with dozens of rock genres. I feel like radio's never been able to figure you out. Mm -hmm. Am I crazy? Yeah, that's crazy, but uh, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I appreciate it because it, it, it has been a little bit of a, of, of a problem with my career, but in some ways, you know, we, we fly under the radar and it's been good because we never really got the big hit that vaulted us to some kind of magnificent success. But at the same time, we just slowly, under the radar, kept kind of getting bigger and bigger, and we've able, been able to have a great career. And mm -hmm. uh, without naming names, we're at a point now where we have platinum-selling bands that, older bands that come out and open up for us now. You know, so you know we're still we're still vital, and uh, so absolutely, yeah. That's it's been a little disappointing, but it, but it, in the big scheme of things, it might have been a blessing, you know. So. Well, and yeah, I mean, you've had such incredible longevity, and what is, I guess, what's the secret to that tenacity? Just not giving up. Yeah, and never, you, never give up, never give up. I was talking before we started recording this about your last album, Rev. One of my favorite songs, and I was hoping I'm sure you've told the story a dozen times. One of my favorite songs on the album is Spooky Boots. Oh yeah. Can you tell the story? Oh okay. Yeah. Well, that we were. Excuse me. We were playing a show in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and there was this old old biker guy that came to see us every time we were in Santa Fe, and he was a short guy who had some type of a of a disability. You know, he was a biker, but he was kind of a small. He wasn't near atypical. But anyway, long story short, he was there and. He sat down with me at when they were feeding us after sound check, and nobody was there. You know, it was before the show, and he started telling me. He goes, "Yeah, he goes, yeah, I had this girl, and and uh, you know, she was it's the best girlfriend I ever had." He said she took care of me. He goes, "You know, I, I have some, kind of a hard time getting dressed, and she'd even help me get dressed, and all this other stuff, and and, and she was just the greatest ever, and." Uh, and um, he said, uh, he goes, yeah. And so, uh, you know, man, I, I've been, I go up to the 
the town square every Saturday looking for her because I think she left me. She le- he, the, his girlfriend left him, and so I go up to the town square where all the sh- the stores are, and I th- keep thinking I'm going to see her. I go there every Saturday, and uh, so I was start. I started thinking about it. I said, uh, "Well, I said, well, you know, I was about to give him one of these kind of guy to guy things. You know, man, maybe it's time to you know let let it go. You mm-hmm. know." And so I said, well, how long has it been? And uh, he said, well, she, uh, he goes, she left in 1969. <laughs> so I was just thinking, well, it's kind of pointless to tell him yeah. to let it go now. I mean, he's come all these years keeping doing that. <laughs> I mean, and, I, and, and I said, well, what's her name? And, and he goes, well, I, he goes, I never, I never knew her real name. I, everyone just called her Spooky Boots. That's amazing. And so I... <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, so after he tells you that story, it's one of those things where you just you look at him and you slowly walk backward, like, okay, oh, um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah okay. I was, yeah, I well, didn't, good, I good didn't, luck, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Best wishes, bro. Yeah. So Texas has a profound amount of blues music coming out of it. We're here in Chicago. How important is the blues to you? It just even recreationally, to say nothing of the music you write. Well. That's another c- connection with, with Chicago. Is that um, when I was a kid, I was riding my bicycle to the to the record store, and I must have been about ten or twelve, and I was tr- trying to play guitar, and I was probably going to buy. I was probably going there to buy a Black Sabbath or an Alice Cooper album. <laughs> But be careful because if we start talking about Alice Cooper, this interview will never end. I'll, I'll talk for like two hours. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, be careful. So let's well, just say it was a Sabbath album. Okay. <laughs> but it was anyway, Master of Reality. I went in there and the guy had this, he was playing blues on in, in the store. And I, and I think it was Sonny Boy Williamson or Howlin' Wolf. I'm not sure. I barely remember. But I just was like, <laughs> and I was like thinking to myself, man, this is scarier than Black Sabbath. Right. So I said, what is that? He goes, it's, you know, it's Howlin' Wolf, kid. You know, and he goes, hey, come over here. And then, so I started to look. He had, he had a great, you know, uh, supply of, of records, and a lot of them were chess records, it was the Chicago thing. Sure. You know, the chess records reissues were hitting big in the, the mid-'70s, early-'70s. And uh, so um, I... Uh, I walked out with a Sonny Boy Williamson and a Buddy Guy album, and so I was off to the races. You That's know? amazing. So, yeah, so um, I started playing those and trying to learn the licks, and I got a book, and uh, I was actually taking guitar lessons. My parents got me some guitar lessons, and I'd only done about six of them when I met a kid in school that was a, he was a classical player, but he goes, oh, you like blues? He goes, hey, look at this. And he could play ninth chords. And so he showed me how to play ninth chords. And that just all of a sudden, it just came into, you know, the whole sliding ninth chord. Slow blues thing came. And I quit taking guitar lessons because I was just off learning off the records myself. And so, uh, yeah, but no, the, the, but yeah, the, that's that's the one thing in Chicago that I've never done, that I've got to I've got to go to see a chess well here's the thing i chicago is this blues mecca i feel like chicago pays a lot of lip service to the blues but we don't do enough to prop it up like you would think that the chess building would be this wonderful museum space this wonderful source for blues information it's really not it's not even on like the tourist radar oh wow and it's it's a it's a shame because i would think when you go through o'hare you'd be hearing buddy guy playing through the, the sound system or, mm-hmm. like I feel like if you fly into Austin you're surrounded by music in the airport yeah. Chicago not so much that's right that's right well they, they should get with the program because yes. that's what a lot of people worldwide think of when they think of Chicago they don't you know let's face it people in um, in Germany they don't care about the Chicago Cubs or the Chicago Bears you and know, honestly, they don't know who they don't really probably even know who Michael Jordan is They're right. so but they know who <laughs> little Walter and Sonny Boy Williamson and Chuck Berry are and so yeah so you know what people also think of really fattening food when it comes to Chicago uh, how's mm. that burger treating you it's great I haven't even been into, been into mine they're on these giant Kaiser rolls 
So the, the yeah. meat's almost like hidden. Uh-huh. And once you get in there, there's something to be said for that thin griddle burger. Mm-hmm. Like I, I like yeah. a big juicy burger, sure, but there's something about that kind of like diner burger. It just hits the spot. Yeah, really, it's great. It's really awesome. Thank you for bringing me here. Have you had the the nerve to try barbecue in the Midwest? Or is it something that's so sacrosanct in your world that you wouldn't even dream of it? Well, no, because barbecue, one great thing about that is is it's a great part of Americana because it it changes in the different regions, you know. Mm -hmm. So, in Texas, it's all about um, brisket and sausage. Mm -hmm. Well, you get up to Memphis and it's more, it's, it's all about pork, pork, Mm -hmm. but they still do good brisket there too. But the sauces change a little bit, you know, in Texas, it's a, it's a spicier, sweet, sweet and spicier, but then you get up to Kansas city and, uh, it's, it's got a little bit less of a spice to it, but it's, it's still real good. I mean, it's, you know, it's it's a just a little bit different. It's a different style when you get to that region. I love going to Arthur Bryant's in Kansas City or, you know, that, they got some good barbecue there. That was so. my first experience going to a real barbecue place. I, I was going to school in Lawrence. We went to Arthur Bryant's. It was super late at night. Served from behind bulletproof glass. Mm-hmm. In a styrofoam container, <laughs> the white bread. That That's great experience. Mm-hmm. I love that. Now in Chicago, I mean, up until not all that long ago, Chicago was all about rib tips and links. Mm. It was very much a south side of Chicago thing. Okay. All right. So you're working on new stuff, which hopefully we'll hear next year, mm-hmm. which is awesome. And Reverend Horton Heat never stops. No, no. <laughs> it just gets harder and harder and harder. I mean, it's a busier. Does it really? Well... Cause I, well, I wouldn't say harder. Because you I, see Reverend Horton on stage, you, know. you're, you look like you're having a good time every time. Mm-hmm. Well, excuse me. This burger is great. Uh-huh. Thanks, but I finally finished it off there. But no, the thing about about me is that I actually enjoy playing music more now than I did when I was younger, and the reason is is because now. When I was when 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 you're younger and the band is is starting out, you know, you, you, if you, whenever you play a gig, it's there's this pressure. It's like, um, you know, wow, this is we're we're in Chicago, we're playing at Lounge Jacks, we better play good so they have us back here at Lounge Jacks. And then you're thinking about all that instead of just thinking about the music and having a good time. And then. A, a year, a few years later, it was like, wow, you know, Tony Ferguson from Interscope's going to be here. We better play good so we can get a record deal. And and by now, none of that matters. You know, mm-hmm. it's just, it's like, forget any of that. We're up here having a good time, and uh, and we're and it's 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 a lot more enjoyable now. The the flip side is I I don't enjoy the traveling as much mm-hmm. because it's it's kind of hard on my body. It's just kind of a hard thing physically to do, and uh, that gets a little bit old, you know. So now when we pull into New York City, I just say, "Look, leave me at the hotel in Jersey. You guys go on in. I'm going to get a cab in there when, mm-hmm. when I have to play the gig." So I'm a I'm I, I guess I'm a little bit of a pansy about it now, you know. But but traveling is hard. It's yeah, it's great hard. once you get there, but mm-hmm. but the experience of flying and if you're on a bus, oh my god, it's grueling. Yeah, it's but you know, in some ways I'm used to it, in some ways I'm not. But you know, I'm so lucky to do what I do, and uh, like I said, I enjoy play, playing music more than ever. So uh, it's all good. It's all good. You know, you mentioned <laughs> Interscope. That that mid '90s, that early to mid '90s period, was just nuts for record companies, for bands, <clears throat> and there was that pressure. We got to get a record deal. You put out liquor in the front. Worked with Al Jorgensen, another Chicago connection. Uh-huh. What was that like? Because Al was, I think, at peak Al Jorgensen at that time. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, he was. I mean, his studio was essentially Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, yeah, and it scared us. Uh, I'll be frank with you, it scared us. <laughs> we're, we're pretty rowdy ourselves, but I mean, no, I, you know, I, without getting into the uh, the. Uh, the extreme details of that there's not really much way to even really talk about that session much but uh 
But, uh, yeah, Al's a character, you know. And, but, you know what, he's all about freedom, you know. I mean, one, you know, I'm not an anarchist, but one great thing about anarchy is that, you know, it's people are free, you know. And so I'm, I am about freedom. So, uh, mm -hmm. so Al, Al, and, you know, he's, uh, he, he helped us a lot on that album. And so, um, you know, my, uh, I owe him a debt of gratitude for, for helping us on that project. So. And some of those songs still stick out in my head. I mean, yeah, right, and oh. do it. I mean, uh huh, yeah, great. Good. Sonically, a little different from the rest of the. I mean, you can feel Jorgensen's influence on uh -huh. on what he did with your vocals and everything, but right, still some. I mean, there's some good songwriting on there. Well, thanks. Yeah, no, no, it was it was it was a a, a, a good album, but uh, it, it was it was kind of a process that was a little bit hard. To, you know, Al does his own thing, and so basically, toward the end of the session, he wasn't listening to anything we were saying at all. You know, so <laughs> amazing. Yeah. All right, all right uh, before I cut you loose, I do want to read the Boost Mobile social media message of the week. I had Stabbing Westward in the car a few episodes ago, uh, who came out around the same time uh, right. as uh -huh. Liquor in the Front. Uh, from this is from listener Noah. Why was Christopher from Stabbing Westward so angry? Doesn't time heal all wounds? Christopher was talking about things that didn't work or connect for the band in the 90s. It's hard to hold grudges in music. I mean, it's not worth it, is it? No, it's you, not worth it You don't strike me all. as someone who would hold a grudge. Yeah, well, no, you know, I can I can be a little bit vindictive, and I pray that I can get better about that. But no, I, I, uh, I, I just... Yeah, it, it, that it just it just sets yourself back, you know. I never like to look back. I like to look forward because, you know, you really never know how things would have been. You know, mm -hmm. you could have, you know, kind of like I was just saying. You know, maybe we, maybe our record would, went platinum and and we were had all these hit songs and all that. But then all of a sudden, the the fallback from that could have been the death knell of my band and I would not even be a musician now. You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I, you, you can never tell what would have happened, you know, so there's no point in holding a grudge. If somebody, you know, if somebody, you know, says something about, uh, you know, mean about Reverend Horton Heath, then I don't forget it, but I, <laughs> I don't let it, you know, it might... And, and some of those are some of my best stories. You know, the Dallas Observer, my wife called me. Uh, we were about to go on stage in front of 10,000 people headlining a festival at Key Arena in downtown Seattle. And Key Arena, I mean, it was big. Yeah. And, and and my wife called me and said, uh, have you heard about what the Dallas Observer just wrote about you? And I was like going, no. And she read it to me, and it was all about how... My career had been over for for a decade, and it was just sad that I'm still out there trying to, you know, make this whole thing work. That's infuriating. And, and, and you know, well, be, because from a journalistic standpoint, it was the exact opposite. I, I was like, I couldn't let her read the whole thing to me because I had to go play in front of 10,000 people. Right. You know, and so, it, you know, from a journalistic standpoint, it, it's, it, you know, so... I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, they could have called me on the phone and found out that we're doing all this stuff, you or, know, yeah. but instead they made up something. They just made up what they thought they just in fit their head. their idea into whatever narrative uh -huh. that was. Well, this kind of brings up one more question. How have you responded to the Internet as a way of bringing your audience closer to you? Are you do you embrace that? I mean, it, it, things are so different now. You talk about surviving in the music industry as long as you have. Your fans have greater access now than they did when they're standing in front of the stage watching you at Lounge X, just through social media. Yeah, maybe, but you know, I and I should be better at social media. You know, it's probably because of my age that I'm. You know, these younger. Well, people, you're forty two. Younger people are. Huh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> but, yeah, plus 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 about two or three years on that one. But anyway, no. <laughs> No, I should be better at social media, but it, it does. It, you know, I mean, there's, it, it is interesting, and and I do enjoy, you know, getting good positive feedback that that I can get off of that, and 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 being able to have the, you know, the fans, you know, let us know, you know, their feelings about the band, and and uh, it, it it it's it's encouraging. So mm -hmm. th that's really nice because. 
you know, I mean, without, you know, the, the, the wild applause is really why, why, you know, you play music, you like the, the, the immediacy of the live thing, but, uh, but having that encouragement, uh, you know, from social media, that's nice too. And so, you know, yeah, it's, it's a whole different world. And then everybody, mm -hmm. you know, in the music business talks about this pretty much every day about the, where things are going. And, uh, and I've made some predictions that had been wildly wrong about what, what would happen with all this stuff, you know. So, uh, you know, for one thing about the, the Internet and, uh, is, that, is that now a lot of young players have access to, to the vintage music that I like mm -hmm. way more than I did when I Everything was Everything ever made, it, it's right there. If you right. Know. So, you know, by the, time, by the time I really wanted to start learning to play uh, Cliff Gallup licks off the Gene Vincent and the Blue Cap, those albums were already collector items. So right. they were already 50 bucks, and here I'm going to be dropping a needle on the thing over and over to try to learn those licks. So it was it, 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 it now you just have you have access to all of that and and so it it's it's really going to help musicians a lot and it, and it is that's a great know, point so. yeah i was just thinking in terms of you know you're not making music for you know to get a record deal or to you know play that whole music industry game you're really doing it for the fans now and so when a fan on, let's say, Facebook or Twitter or wherever says, you know, I was having a really shitty time in my life. I put on It's Martini Time. Turn me around. I mean, that's the kind of stuff I've got to think makes it great to be an artist. Hey, absolutely. It makes it great to be an artist. And, uh, you know, well, I get those stories every night. You know, every night somebody tells me, we we danced at a wedding to your song in your wildest dreams. Oh, and man. that somebody was saying that last night. And... And uh, so, uh, you know, that kind of thing happens, and it's 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 heartfelt. It's it's a nice thing. Well, Jim, Reverend Horton Heat, you are an American classic. Thanks for sharing cheeseburgers in my car. Well, thank you for having me. That was really excellent. I I would I wouldn't have come here today unless you'd have brought me, and I'm so glad I did. <laughs>